Yeah. How we doing? Sound great. You guys are fired up. I love it, man. God is good. Amen. All the time. God is good. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, for those that are visiting, yeah, we are this crazy, <laughs> but we love to worship God. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Um, my name is Soy. Yes, like soy sauce. <laughs> yeah, soy sauce. Low sodium, though. Low sodium. Green cap. <laughs> Can't have too much sodium. I got the green cap. <laughs> uh, but I get to serve as one of the pastors here uh, at City Line. And um, again, if you're visiting, it's your first time, just um, sit back. You're here for a reason, though, but, but be attentive. Soak it in, you know what I mean? Because God is communicating something to you. Um, and that very thing is that he loves you. Amen? Amen. And so just, just sit in his presence and sit in his love as we uh, learn about him and we, we learn together and we're on this journey of life together. Uh, for those that are tuning in online, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, if you miss any portion of this series, uh, which is entitled I Am, Jesus in His Own Words, go to citylineonline.org where you can get caught up. Uh, we have a podcast as well. You can check out the messages on there. Um, and don't miss out because by show of hands, a round of applause. How many of you guys have been learning something in this series so far? Yes. God is good all the time. Yeah, so uh, if you're online, yo, we want you here. So get dressed. Don't be lazy. Just come on over here and fellowship with your brothers and sisters because we love you just as God loves you. Amen. So over the last several weeks, we've been in this series. Like I said, it's called I Am. Jesus in his own words. Hold on one second before I go any further, please. Um, if, if I say something during this message that, that you agree with or that you like, like you like what you hear or it resonates inside you, like, oh, yeah, then I want you guys to be interactive. You can say uh, a couple things. You can say amen. Everybody say amen. You can say yeah. Everybody say yeah. I like this. You can say word. Everybody say word because that's what we're talking about, right? Jokes. <laughs> you can say, mm -hmm, whatever it is, but if it's something, don't be forced, but if it's something that you feel like God is speaking to, or you like that word or whatever, say amen, say yes, yeah, say hallelujah, you can clap, you can do that. I won't, hey, I won't get, I won't get distracted. <laughs> I know that you're paying attention is why. <laughs> I know that, you know, God is teaching something to you guys. So, again, over the last several uh, weeks we've been talking, uh, we've been in this series called I Am. There's statements of Jesus as recorded in the book of John. Um, but the thing about these I am statements is that they aren't your usual, like, I am statements that you would hear from, like, maybe your friend or your husband or your, your, your son or your daughter. They aren't statements like Jesus is saying, like, oh, man, um, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. No. They're not statements like, ah, uh, I'm thirsty, although he did say that in his life. He did say, I'm thirsty. It's not like that. It's not like, and if you're a parent, you'll, you'll, you'll feel me on this one, if you have children that are young age. It's not like Jesus was saying, oh, I'm bored, right? How many of you parents have heard that one? You know, I've shared this with every service, but we're at Disneyland of all places, the happiest place on earth. And my son has a nerve to say to me, I'm bored. I'm like, this entire, you're so spoiled, man, come on. I would go to Disneyland like once in every like five, six years if I was, you know, fortunate enough to my parents, but... Man, we got past it. But anyway, it's not like Jesus is saying those things. He's making bold, profound statements. It's not like he's even saying like, oh, check this miracle out, water into wine, I'm the man. He's not even saying that. He's making these bold, profound statements, powerful statements. And if you look closely at each time he makes these I am statements, oftentimes you'll find people questioning. They're like, well, what do you mean you're leaving and we can't go with you? What do you mean when you say this? Wait, well, sometimes people took it entirely the wrong way. But what Jesus was in fact doing, church, was that he was revealing the true character and nature of God through these I am statements. And as he was doing that, those that he was calling to himself and to God, he wanted people to truly understand who God is, to know God, and not only that, to understand and comprehend how much God loved them. Guess what? He hasn't changed. And so he continues to reveal himself to his creation, us, through many different ways. First and foremost is through his word. Amen. You read the word, and God reveals himself clearly to us in his word. He can reveal himself to us through relationships, marriages, Friendships, parental relationships, son to, son, to, son to father, father to daughter, different things of that nature. Through life experiences, in the ups and in the downs, he reveals.
reveals himself to us. Because he wants us to know him. To know him. To understand how much he loves us. As a matter of fact, if you look all the way back into the book of Exodus and you dust off, you <laughs> Exodus, thousands of years ago, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, there's a man by the name of Moses who was given this task by God. He says, Moses, I'm choosing you, and I want you to deliver my people out of slavery from the hands of Egypt. Liberate them. Daunting task for anyone. Moses is like, okay. And after much persuasion, he says, okay, God, I'll do it. <clears throat> but if I go to these leaders and I say, hey, I I'm, your, I'm here to liberate you. I'm here to free you. They're going to ask me, well, who, who sent you? Who in the world sent you? Who, who, who are you talking about? And through this burning bush, God tells him this. He says, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. Jehovah, Yahweh. Thousands of years ago, God was, and what was the sole purpose? He said, liberate them because I want them to worship me. I want them to come meet me. I want them to know who I am. The unchanging, the eternal, the self-existing God, I am, Yahweh, Jehovah. Jesus, once again, fast forward a few thousand years. And Jesus, once again, echoes this declaration in John chapter 8, verse 58, as the Pharisees question him, well, who are you? He said, we know you're, you're, you're Joseph's boy. Who, in fact, are you? He said, they say, we're from the seed of Abraham. Who are you? And then he tells them, says, you know what, before Abraham was even born, I am. Don't get me wrong, there was nothing wrong with Jesus' grammar. I didn't read that incorrectly to you guys. Because <laughs> normally you say, yeah, before he was born, I was there. No. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, he made a statement, again, echoing what God was saying thousands of years ago. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Revealing himself to creation so that they would know him. The same God yesterday, today, and forevermore reveals himself and continues to reveal himself to us so that we would know him and know how much he loves us. In week one of this series, Jesus tells us, I am the bread of life. And that whoever comes to me will never be hungry or thirsty again. What a statement. What a bold statement. And that he is all you need. And he is enough for you, Pastor Jack put it simply but so profoundly, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Week two, Pastor Troy shared with us that Jesus said, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, he says. And he is the light that exposes our sin in us. But doesn't leave us in that state. He then leads us out of the darkness and into the light and the life in which he has called us to. I am the light of the world. Week three. Pastor Jack taught on I am the gate. And he had a door up here. Beautiful illustration. And he said that anyone who comes through him will be saved. And that Jesus has come to bring them life and life abundantly, life to the fullest, life limitless, life great test, amen? And last week, Pastor Megan talked about how Jesus said, I am the good shepherd that laid down and sacrificed his life for the sheep. And his desire is that we know him and that he knows us just as intimately as he says that he knew the Father. Echoing that statement. Today's foundational scripture, it's in your handouts. If you have your Bibles, old school like me, <laughs> John chapter 15, or you can turn your flip, uh, your, your smartphones or tablets on, John chapter 15. We're going to read this in a few minutes here. Um, but this is where Jesus makes another one of his profound, his bold, his powerful I am statements. And he says this, he says, I am the true vine. I am <clears throat> the true vine. And before we read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, I want to give you guys a little bit of background, a little bit of context, so just we understand what exactly is going on, not only in the life of Jesus, but in the life of his disciples as well. So we can kind of just sit in that and see the circumstances that, you know, everything that's going on in his life. So we find ourselves on Thursday night 
of the whole of Holy Week or Passion Week. So this is the night before Jesus gets arrested, put, or the night before Jesus is crucified. This is Thursday night we find ourselves here. And it says, in, in, if you look at John's chapter 13 and 14 and then also 15, that Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room and they were sharing a meal together, having a good time. You know, anytime I share food with people, I love having a good time. We laugh and joke. And I don't know, it might have been a little somber moment because Jesus knew what was going to happen. But in, nevertheless, he was sharing a meal with these 12 disciples. And at this point, he begins to wash their feet, it says. Every single one of them, including G Judas, who we know ends up betraying him, washes their feet. If we eat together, you don't want to wash my feet. Trust that, okay? <laughs> I'll leave that to myself. I'll wash my own feet. But this is what Jesus, amen. <laughs> yeah, my, if my wife was here, she'd be like, mm, yes, yes, yes. But this is what we find. Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, having a meal with them. And this is where he reveals to them within this meal, within this setting, he says, one of you guys are going to betray me. Imagine that. One of you guys are going to betray me. And then he goes on to say, I'm only going to be with you guys for a little while longer, and I'm going to be leaving. But where I go, you cannot come. However, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He says, but I'm not going to leave you alone. He said, the Holy Spirit will come, and he will live in you forever and be with you. And as we enter into chapter 15 here, we see that there are only 11 disciples now. As we said, Judas, the one who betrayed him, has left the group to do his thing and sell out and betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And the end of chapter 14 ends with Jesus and his disciples. It says, Jesus says, come now, let us leave. And they begin to take a walk through the city of Jerusalem. It's evening. They're taking a walk. And this walk would ultimately lead them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus ultimately was uh, kissed with a kiss of betrayal, arrested, and then put on trial, and we know the rest that happens there. And this right here, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, this is pretty much like the last meaningful conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. So let's read that, okay? Remember all that context. John chapter 15, he's walking through the city of Jerusalem. It's evening, and they're walking toward the garden. Jesus says this. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. And he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Again, I am the vine you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. And such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And keep on going. As a father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands. And remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no, uh, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. What a profound conversation to have. It's like a last conversation with his disciples knowing what was going to happen, knowing what had just happened as Judas departed from him, knowing what this was leading up to, he gives them this analogy. And he lays it out very plainly. And he says this, he says, he's walking with his disciples. They probably saw a vineyard or a vine somewhere. And he says, look, there's a gardener. And he says, there's also a vine. And attached to these vines, or this vine, are branches. He says, in every vine that doesn't bear fruit, the gardener comes and cuts off that vine. However, every vine that does bear fruit, he says, the gardener comes and he prunes it so that it will bear even more fruit. Plainly and simply, but very profound. 
And there are three things today, church, that I want to discuss and identify today as we study the scripture together. Number one, we're going to talk about the branches. Number two, we're going to talk about the vine. And number three, we're going to talk about the gardener. And we're going to see that each one of these things are very symbolic and significant and represent something else. So the first thing we're going to be talking about, number one in your handouts, if you're following along, is the branch. The disciples, the branches. Disciples are the branches. Now in verse 5 of our scripture, Jesus tells his disciples that they are the branches in this analogy. But we have to take it even a step further when we're looking at this. And we have to point out that there are actually two types, and here's your next feeling, two types of branches here in this analogy, in this metaphor. Ones that don't bear fruit and ones that bear fruits. It's also interesting to note that all of these branches in some way or another are attached to the vine. Attached to the vine. But the ones, as we said, that don't bear fruit are cut off. They die, they, they wither, and they're burned. And so you're talking about, okay, if the branches are the disciples, then who are those branches that aren't bearing fruit that are cut off? W what is that supposed to mean? It's a great question. But we have to refer to context of this scripture and what we just talked about, all the things leading up, who Jesus was talking to, who was involved. And we have to see and remember that just hours prior to this, Jesus was with the 12 in the upper room, and they were sharing a meal together. And in that very same room, just as there were two types of branches in this analogy, there were two types of disciples in that room, church. True disciples and a false disciple. That's your next feeling. A true disciple and a false disciple. And we know Judas to be that false disciple who later betrays Jesus, as we said, for 30 pieces of silver. Sells him out. Sells him out. If we look at what's going on at this particular moment and all the events surrounding it and the culmination of what is about to happen, we can very plainly see, and it's clear that Jesus is talking about this. He'd spent three years with these 12. Poured out his life into these 12 ministered to these 12, saw the growth in these 12, corrected them when they were incorrect in these 12, loved these 12, washed their stinking feet, these 12. <laughs> Love them. Love them. And yet, despite all that, one of them was still going to betray him. And we see how much this hurt Jesus. John chapter 13, 21, it says that Jesus was troubled in his spirit when he had to say that one of you guys are going to betray me. He was troubled. It bothered him that much. Because outwardly, Judas appeared to be attached like these vines, or like these branches to the vine. He was rolling with Jesus. He was part of the twelve. Spent his, the most, Jesus spent the most time with them. He's the one that had the money. He was the money man, money man, money man, Judas. He was like, you want, you want this? Make it rain up in here. Come on. He was attached to Jesus, the vine. But we see, just as the verses said, that those branches that do not bear fruit will be cut from the vine. This is in reference to false disciples. And the disciples merely this, someone who follows Jesus or professes to follow Jesus. Those that profess or know to follow Christ, but whose relationship with him is insincere, with no fruit to show. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. He says, not everyone who says to me, who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some sobering words, church. This message is here to challenge us, but not only challenge us, but to encourage us. And he goes on to say, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Just as you walk up to a tree and you see an apple, that's ah, an apple tree. You walk up to another tree and see whatever, that, that you identify by their fruit. Now on the other side of that, there are the true disciples, the branches that do bear fruit. His disciples that remained with him and in him and obeyed his commands and stuck with Jesus until the very bitter end. Some of you might say, no, whoa, 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 hold on a sec, Pastor. Yeah, you mentioned Judas, but there was another dude, uh, Peter, denied him. 
after he was told he was going to do it, not once, not twice, but three times, thrice. <laughs> going to do King James on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> three times denying. And he's like, no, nah, I'll, I'll never do that. I'm your boy, man. That's, I'm the rock, Petra, Peter. And it happened. Denied him three times. Yes, but Peter saw his wrongdoing. Peter continued to put his faith and trust in Jesus and was forgiven and was reinstated into the ministry. And if you look at the fruit that Peter bore in his ministry, look into the New Testament, there was much fruit that came from it. And some of you may be asking, hey, you keep saying fruit, Pastor. Man, it's already close to lunch and it's past lunch and I'm hungry as it is. Thinking about fruit and fruit pies, it was pie day the other day and I was like, has people posting pies, like it has nothing to do with pies. Pie is 3.14, okay. <laughs> Like, stop posting pie, you know, apple pies and cherry pies. It's like, nothing to do with that. I'm just making me hungry. You keep saying fruit, fruit, fruit. I'm hungry, Pastor. What are you talking about, this fruit here in this metaphor? Here's your next feeling. The fruit that Jesus is talking about is the evidence of a life that is planted and rooted in a genuine, 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 irre genuine remix relationship with God. Can I get an amen for that? That's the fruit that Jesus is referring to, a life, the evidence of a life that is planted and rooted in a genuine relationship with God. So you may say, what does that even mean? What does a life that is planted and rooted in a relationship with God even look like? You can write the scripture down, and on your notes, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, tells us that if anyone, everyone say anyone, anyone is in Christ, in, uh, remains in Christ, is planted, is rooted in Christ, it says that the old things are what? are gone, church, and the new whew, has come, a transformation, a regeneration. Can I get an amen for that? That is what a life, a evidence of life that is rooted and planted in God looks like. Well, somebody said, I still don't follow. I still don't follow. Psalm chapter 1. I'm going to read this because it's an awesome scripture. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 spells it out very well as well. And it says this. <clears throat> Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Get this. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, whatever he does, prospers. Can I get an amen for that, church? That is what an evidence of a life that is rooted and planted in Jesus Christ looks like doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but he delights in the word of God, church. And on this word, he eats from it, and he draws his life and his, his, his resources from it. He is like a tree planted by the river, that whatever season comes, when the storms of trials and tribulation come, when the winds come, it says it doesn't matter because he's planted by the water and his fruit will grow because he is in a relationship, a genuine planted and rooted relationship with God. And his leaves do not wither. Can I get an amen for that? That is what a life looks like that is rooted and planted in a genuine relationship with God. You say, wait a minute. You're talking a lot about good works here, Pastor. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 10 tells us that we're saved by grace through faith and not of our good works. Yeah, it does. You're right. You're absolutely right. But if you go on to read that scripture, it also says, For we are God's workmanship, his Greek poema, his masterpiece, his work of art, created in who? Christ Jesus planted, rooted in him to do what? Good works. Oh, there it is. Created in Christ Jesus to do these works, these good works, this fruit that will last. Again and again in scripture, the Bible says that true faith manifests itself through the fruit of good works. And faith without works is dead. Finito. Done. Complete. It's over. Dead. Just like that branch that has been cut from the vine because there was no we are known by our fruit. <laughs> and 
And the only way, as it says in John chapter 15, that we can bear this fruit is to abide, is to remain in Jesus, staying in a genuine relationship with God, with Christ, so that his life, his power, his resources can work in and through us to bear much fruit for his glory. Can I get an amen for that one? Yes, yes, yes. Now remember what we read. The branches that have fruit that are pruned are pruned so that they will bear more fruit. Now, some of you may be asking, well, what is this pruning all about? I don't understand. What was this pruning? We'll talk about that more in a bit, okay? Just give me a few minutes, okay? But as followers, I want you guys to note this. As followers of Christ, pruning is a process that we all must go through. We're not exempt from it. So I'm just giving you a heads up like Jesus did. Expect it. It's a process that we all must go through. And it may be a bit, probably not maybe, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable and maybe even painful at first. But we have to remain in Christ and trust the process. Knowing that the result will only be more fruit for his glory. One of my favorite movies growing up, I'm going to give you guys a little secret about Pastor Saul here. (laughs) I'm going to age myself here too. One of my favorite movies growing up is The Karate Kid. I'm not talking about the remake with Jaden Smith. No. Throw that one out the window, please. Sorry. I like Will Smith, but that Karate Kid was not. not. Okay. Karate Kid. Parts one and two. Anything after two, like three and four, I'm like, uh, I'm just going to go back. Number one. Yes, man. So we had this movie on uh, VH. I remember my dad rented it from the warehouse. You guys remember the warehouse? (laughs) Be kind, rewind, right? <laughs> you hit with that fee if you don't rewind. The, the Some of you millennials are like, what is he talking about? Be Rewind what? <laughs> Anyways, it's a VCR, VHS tape. And we had this movie. My dad bought it. We're like, oh, my God, you bought Karate Kid. And me and my brother who was here at the last service, we would just watch that movie religiously. We knew all the lines, dude. We would set up, and I'm like, okay, I'm Daniel's son, and you're Johnny. He's like, no, no, I'm, I'm Daniel's son, you're Johnny. I was like, no, nah, I got the crane kicker right. It's, I'm, I'm <laughs> like, I'm going to put you in a body bag, you know. We had all the lines memorized, and we love this movie, dude. I mean, what's not to like, man? These dudes were Cobra Kai evil. Oh, I hated them. They were dressed in Halloween, the, the skulls. I was like, oh, evil. They're, they're evil. And Daniel's son was just in a, in a shower. You know? <laughs> well, anyways, watch the movie if you haven't seen it. It's an awesome movie. So there's this scene. Daniel was getting bullied by these, these Cobra Kai people, and he was riding his bike home, and these dudes pull up in their uh, motorcycle. Mm, mm, they play this music. Dun, 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 dun. And, like, Daniel's, like, riding, oh, my gosh. And all of a sudden you see them coming. He's, like, three or four or five guys in motorcycles, and they kick him, and he's riding his bike, and he tumbles down this hill. He gets hurt, and he picks up his bike. I hate this bike, this stupid bike, and he throws it in the dumpster. Those are the exact lines. Go watch it, okay? <laughs> God, he's down, man. And he just, the bike is destroyed. He throws it away. He's upset. Mr. Miyagi... Yeah, he, he sees all this going on. He hears a noise. What's going on? And he takes the bike out of the dumpster. He fixes it, put it on, puts it on Daniel's doorstep. Daniel comes home and sees it. He's like, oh, my God, someone took my bike, Mr. Miyagi. So he goes in to thank him, right? He goes downstairs, and he goes in, and he walks in. And as he walks in, Mr. Miyagi is busy there. And what he's doing is he's pruning the bonsai tree. Cutting it. And he walks away. And he's like, many trees. Like, hey, bonsai, bonsai tree. <laughs> Bonsai, bonsai. <laughs> Watch it. It's awesome, man. Yeah, where was all this in the remake? No, it was non-existent. So anyways, so <laughs> what the process, and, and Mr. Miyagi had to explain to them that in order for this bonsai tree, although it looked nice, in order for it to truly take shape and character, some of the excess branches had to be cut off. Snip here, snip there, and you step back and you're like, ooh, this is beautiful. Character, shape. And it blew my mind years later. I was like, oh, my God, the bonsai tree is symbolic of Daniel's son because Daniel's son had to go through all this whole ordeal of trials and tribulations. He had to cut off some bad relationships, cut off some bad friendships. So in the end, he could be the All-Valley Championship with a crane kick. And by the end of the movie, after he had been pruned of all this, just like that bonsai tree, he stood there with character. (laughs) Oh, this is a good (laughs) reference. He stood there with character because of this pruning process. I was like, oh, my God, I see it. Oh, man. This is what God does for us, church. Sometimes there's things in our lives that need to be pruned, need to be snipped, some excess stuff. Need to be cut off or cleaned. That word pruned in the Greek is katheiro. It means to be cleansed or to clean. Different from cutting that the branch with no fruit bear. Maybe that's toxic relationships. Maybe it's habitual or secret sins and lifestyles. 
addictions or anything else that can hinder us from our growth in God because we are the branches connected to the vine. And here's where I'd like to challenge you, church. I want to challenge you guys. I don't want to encourage you guys with the word of God, right? Do some self-examination, self-inventory. Are we, in fact, bearing fruit? I want to challenge you today to really sit in that for a moment and ask yourselves that question. And if you are a professed follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, and you can't answer that question with a resounding yes, then you have to truly ask yourselves, well, okay, who or what am I really connected to? Who or what am I really attached to? What kind of growth is actually happening? Who or what am I drawing my life source from? Number one, the disciples are the branches. You guys getting something so far? Let's go to the next point. Number two is your next fill-in. Jesus Christ is the true vine. Jesus Christ is the true vine. In verse one of our scripture here, Jesus tells his disciples that he is the true vine. And again, he was using imagery and concepts that were familiar to those people at the time. Just like he used gates and, and sheep and shepherds and different things of that nature. Vineyards were important in the life and the economy of Israel. So they understood what he was talking about. Well, he tried to make them very plainly to them. You see, because the vine is the life source of the branches. It provides the nutrients and the resources to strengthen them and help them to bear fruit. And Jesus just drops a bomb on them here. As he tells them, the only way that you can bear fruit, he says, is if you remain in me. Because apart from me, he says, you can't do it. Very plainly here, can't do it. Here's your next fill-in. Apart from Jesus, the vine, you can't achieve anything of spiritual value. You will not bear any fruit that will last, church. Challenging message, sobering message, and encouraging message, hopefully. Now, this is very important to understand, to know that we need to remain in Christ. We need to be planted and rooted in a genuine relationship with him. It's very important to understand. But I believe that this wasn't the main reason that Jesus said that he was the true vine. And here's why. I believe he said that he is the true vine because there was an old vine. There was a, a defective vine. There was a corrupted vine, and that vine was Israel. If you look, if you write this down too, and I, I want to encourage you to read it, Isaiah chapter 5 and Psalm chapter 80, the Old Testament, Israel was called God's vine. And it spells out in detail what they were called and what they did. But as we see in the history of Israel, they continued to be unfaithful to God. They continued to, to be idolatrous and, and worship other gods. They continued to be immoral. And ultimately, after God gave them time, he was gracious with them, and God ended up judging them. word the church what from the pulpit we'll get into that in a second okay now why am i mentioning this why are you talking about israel well the mindset of most of the jewish people at that time including the disciples was that hey we're jews our forefather was abraham we're connected we're with god yes because we're jews we're, that, that's our forefather that's the we're from the seed of abraham and they thought automatically by default they were it. That they had that, that granted them a connection to God. And we can see how that played out in the New Testament. In the relationships with the Jews and the Gentiles and the Greeks and the Samaritans. And even amongst the disciples. They were upset and offended that the gospel was being preached to these non-Jews, these Gentiles. Well, wait a minute. They said, okay, well, uh, if you want to be connected, if you want to be in, then you got to do certain, you got to do X and X and X. And all these rules and regulations were placed on them. And said, okay, and then when you do that, then you're attached. Then you're connected. Jesus, in saying that he is the true vine, he destroyed this. He obliterated this mindset. And here's your next fill-in. He said, if you truly want to be connected to God, then you must be connected in a relationship with me, the true vine. He is the only true way to the Father, church. Maybe there's some false vines in our lives. 
that it take, attempt to take the place of the true vine. Perhaps you feel, I'm automatically connected to God because I go to church. I'm a member of that church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even read my Bible, and I pray. I'm a good dude. I got good works. I mean, I'm a stand-up guy. I'm connected. Jesus says, don't get that mindset. If you truly want to be connected to God, he says, it starts with me. It starts with me, a connection and a relationship with Jesus. He says he is the only way to the Father. Jesus Christ, the true vine, the one who provides everything we need in this life. He is our life source, supplying us with what we need to bear fruit that brings glory to God. Is this making sense to some of you guys? Number two, Jesus Christ is the true vine, and only through him are we connected to the Father. And the third point in your handout, or in your fill-in, God the Father, the gardener. Some translations say he's the workman, the husbandman, the farmer. Uh, for this particular NIV gardener, we're going to go with gardener. Now in verse 2 of our foundational scripture, Jesus tells his disciples that the gardener is none other than God the Father. And rightfully so, the gardener surveys and works the land. He waters the crops, harvests them when they're ready, seeing what fruit is or isn't being produced. Now let's just say for an example, someone name a fruit, throw it out there. What it? Apple? Orange? Watermelon, I like apple. Let's go apple. Our apple. <laughs> we'll go with apple. Let's just say you have, you buy an apple tree in its infant stage. You're like, ah, oh, I love apples. I got this apple tree, and I'm going to plant it in my backyard. And you got a perfect spot for it. You're like, I know exactly where this apple tree is going to go. And you go in your backyard into the, the, the area, and you begin to prepare the land around it. You're digging up the soil. Oh, this, can, this is going to go here. Boom, you put it in there. Shh, shh, shh. No, nothing's going to, oh, this, this apple tree is going to go the wrong. Boom. And day after day, you come, and you care for it. You water it. And you sing to it. Oh, here, fun fact, fun fact real quick. <laughs> my brother was not here, but I use this example <laughs> in, the three or in two services. So my brother had this plant, my older brother, and his girlfriend gave it to him. <laughs> I was teasing him. I'm like, yeah, plant, dude, in our room. We shared a room. And he would play classical music for this plant. <laughs> Put it by the speaker and then play classical music. I'm like, this guy, I'm like, he sprung. We used to use that word sprung. But sure enough, dude, this plant began to just grow, and it was beautiful. So green thumb tip. Play music for your plants, classical music or whatever, worship music maybe, and then it's, it'll grow holy fruit from it. I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, so you're caring for this apple tree, and you're playing music for it, and you're singing to it, and you're not letting the cats around because you don't want them to, you know, you're getting all the soil ready. <laughs> weeks come, you're watering it, days, weeks, months pass, and you begin to see it growing, and it's growing, and now the stump is there, and it's getting big, and now branches start to appear. You're like, yes, and now the green leaves are there, and the shrub, you're like, oh, I can all but taste those juicy apples. I'm like, apple pie, apple cobbler, apple juice. All these apple things are going to happen in my household with this beautiful apple tree. So you're ready. It's apple season. Coming out. Oh, beautiful. Oh, man, you get your basket ready. You're picking apples. You're like, huh, wait. You bring me the ladder. I think they're up on top. And there's no apples. Wait a minute. This tree is grown. There's branches. There's leaves. Why is there no fruit? Is that a normal process? Is that normal? No. The natural process of things and growth of things, you care for it, you water it, it grows, and as an apple tree, it begins to bear apples as fruit, right? Huh. God the gardener does the same thing here. And he's doing two things here that we see in this scripture that are plainly laid out. And we cannot dance over them. We can't sidestep over them. We need to address these things that he says here. Because Jesus is speaking very plainly to us. And there's this in your next film. God the gardener is judging the false branches and pruning the true fruit-bearing branches. Whoa, hold on a second, Pastor. You lost me there. The J word, judging. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Some harsh language there, Pastor. It is. Jesus said it. It's in red, so take it up with him. <laughs> It's harsh. It's a sobering message. It's a sobering message, but it's a challenging and encouraging message, church. We can't sidestep this. It's in there. We can't gloss over it. We can't turn our eyes blindly to it. But this work of judging and pruning is a divine work. That only God, only God, 
the gardener can do. Can I get an amen for that church? And I'm happy that he has that because not only is God loving, not only is he caring, not only is he patient, not only is he forgiving, but he is also just and he is also holy. And he operates with precision and perfection. Perfection, church. And he's a good, good gardener. We can change that. Good, good gardener. You got that? <laughs> no, nah, that's horrible, man. <laughs> horrible, horrible, horrible. My apologies. <laughs> He's perfect. That's what I'm saying. And that's a divine work reserved for God and God alone, church. It is God who is the final judge. It is God that can both give and take away. And that's him. That's on him. Praise God. But God always gives us ample opportunities for repentance. Write the scripture down. It's not in your notes. Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9. And it even uses a vineyard as, as, a, as an example on that too. I don't, we don't have time to read it. But um, he always gives opportunities for repentance. And he's patient and he's kind. But it's unfortunate there are people that choose to be disconnected and stay disconnected from the loving arms of God the Father. And just as scripture says here, God is going to judge them. But that's something reserved for him. He's the gardener. He's the gardener. But the fruit, true fruit-bearing branches, he prunes, it says. He cleanses, katheo. And we talked a little bit about pruning earlier and how it essentially is the act of cutting away excess or unnecessary things so that the branch can be more productive. This is the work of God the gardener as well, church. You see, the greatest judgment that God can have on someone is just to leave them alone and to let them be. Said, okay, but we learned that God is the light. He exposes the sin in our lives, but then takes us out of that darkness and into the light. He doesn't leave us there. He loves us too much to leave us the way we are. Can I get an amen for that church? Yeah. Out of the mouth of babes. Yep, there it is. <laughs> this is the work of God the gardener as well. But as we said, these I am statements truly reveal God's character and his nature. Because he loves us so much, he prunes us. He'll cut off the stuff we, we, we don't necessarily need so that we can bear more fruit, it says. But don't get me wrong here. Pruning doesn't only mean that he's cutting off only the evil things and the sinful things, and you're so sinful, I'm cutting this and cutting that. And it's not, he's not only talking about that here. He can also prune that which is good and better to make way for what is greater. Can I get an amen for that? He can do that as well. And so how, how, how does he prune us, Pastor? We should know that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, it's in your, your handouts there, that the word of God you're filling, the word of God is the knife that prunes us. The word of God is the knife that prunes us. Let me read the scripture here. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of to him. We must give account. And there it is, church. The word of God is a knife that prunes us. He used the word to prune and cleanse us because it's like a mirror that shows us our sin. That's found in James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. You can write that down too. The word is like a mirror that shows us our sin. James 1, 22 to 25. God will also chasten and discipline us as his children. As a parent, remember I said God reveals himself to us through different things, through relationships, even a, a, from a, a parent, a, a father to son. And so... My son is 10 years old. If, if I saw him running outside of our house and running into the street because I love him, I would stop him and say, no, don't go any further. Come back over here. Let me tell you what you did wrong. You know, you shouldn't do that because if you go in the street and run wildly, you could get hit by a car. If I didn't love him, I would say, okay, go play in the street. I'm going to go be in here playing the PlayStation 4, NBA 2K. Go ahead, do your thing. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And verses 6 through 11 explains this well. That says God disciplines those whom he loves, church. And as I said, that pruning process, we're not exempt from it if we're followers of Christ. It's going to happen because he loves us, church. 
Because he wants to see what's best for us. He wants to see us live that limitless life. Sometimes we'll have to endure trials and tribulations in our lives, knowing that the testing of our faith develops perseverance, and this helps us to grow and become mature and complete, as James chapter 1 says. Worship team, you can come on up here. I want to share with you guys a very personal example of, uh, of this today. Now, um, as most of you know, uh, my mom passed away last May 12 from a, a rare cancer of the uterus, and around December of that year, um, is when she, the symptoms started really showing. She began, she began to get sick, and she was in and out of the hospital. And around December of, of this last year, my dad's health took a turn for the worse, too. And he was in and out of the hospital. He was dealing with um, extreme fatigue and, and exhaustion, chest pains, um, shortness of breath. And it was like deja vu. It was like the same timing, the same ver or vocabulary that the doctors were using. Oh, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's causing it. We don't know why his body is at or her or his body is acting that way, but it's, we can't figure it out. And I was like, oh, here we go again. I was like, oh, this timing of this. And it was a pruning process for me. Pastor Jack was up here during the Limitless series, and he was talking about fear. And it sat there, and it hit me. I began to just sob. God was pruning me. And here's why. When my mom passed, a lot of you guys prayed for that. I prayed for us, and I, and I, I know I drew that strength from the prayers and from God. And I felt that, you know, I was strong for the family. I need to be strong for the family, and I helped them through it, the process. But everyone took it really hard. And as my dad got sick, I began to play things in my mind. I said, what if my dad passes? And that fear came in me. And I feared that I would not be able to have that same strength that I had when my mom passed if my dad were to pass. And then God spoke to me. He says, what do you mean, you? I'm the one that gave you that strength, soy. I'm the one that provided you with that resource, soy. It was not about you. It was about me and giving you the strength. So you take my strength and you go with it. And I had to trust God in that process, that pruning process. That even if he decided to take my dad away, because the Lord giveth and he taketh away. And if he were to call him home, I'd have to trust that process. And from that pruning, I would be looking forward to more fruit to be born, to be produced. And so likewise, long story short, they discovered my dad had fluid in his lungs and in his heart, uh, the, the sac around the heart, which is called the per pericardial sac. And they had to drain it. And they didn't know what was causing it. They still don't know up to now. And he's, shout out to Pops if you're watching uh, online. He's still in, in the recovery room, so he's, gonna, he's doing good. But it got pretty bad, and he was admitted into the ICU. And when we visited him, if you know my Pops and you're close to my Pops, he, he was different. That strength, that Master Yoda likeness, it was just really, man, I, I, it was just something was just sucking the life out of him. Not just physically, but spiritually and emotionally. And I'm not saying my dad wavered in his faith, but it was just, as he described it, an oppression on him. And so I had to be very intentional on encouraging him. I said, Pops, God is greater. Pops, we're with you all the way on this, man. And I had to... So one night it was just me and my wife in the room in ICU, and I had to hit him with some hard questions. And I had to ask him, I said, Pops, do you st still think you have something to live for? I know mom's gone home. And he told me, yes, but he still had something to live for. For God wasn't done with him yet. That those thoughts initially came to mind where it's easier to give up and be home with the father and be with my wife. But he said he dismissed those things right away, church. Right away. And he knew God wasn't done with him yet. He had surgery done last week. And he continued to abide and remain in Jesus, the vine. And there was some pruning going on for all of us, my dad included, for sure. But we know based on what we just read that this pruning was happening for a reason, to bear more fruit for the glory of God. Can I just remind you guys this, that fruit isn't grown to be placed on a pedestal and sit there and watch as it rots away. Fruit is grown so that others, not even the branches are supposed to eat, fruit is grown so that others can see the fruit and take it and taste it and see that God is good. Can I get an amen for that? That's what fruit is for and that's how God gets the glory through this pruning process.
to bear more fruit for the glory of God. And wouldn't you know it, just two hours after his surgery, as my dad laid in ICU bedridden with tubes inside of him, a nurse, his nurse, attending nurse by the name of Patrick comes into the room, begins to attend to my dad, and my dad begins to have a conversation with him. And for the next two hours, Patrick begins to talk to my dad and spill out his life and how he's bitter and how he's resentful of the world and, and how he just has harbors so much bitterness inside of him. And bedridden on the, in ICU on bed, my dad begins to minister to this Patrick guy, bearing more fruit for the glory of God during this pruning process. Can I get an amen for that? And another nurse, Nancy, who overhears that my dad is a pastor, attends to him and begins to open up to him about the relationship that she's having with her teenage children and how it's, it's, it's broken. It's a hurting relationship. And what does my dad do sitting in bed, bedridden? He begins to minister to her needs, more fruit for the glory of God. Can I get an amen for that during this pruning process? Yet another nurse, Jamie opens up to him, and here she's a pastor, and opens up to him, and, and she talks about how her and her husband are childless, and they've been praying to have a child. And what does my dad do? God, uh, he, my dad prays for her, ministers to her needs in ICU. More fruit for the glory of God that these people who are looking, who are hungry, can taste and see that God is good, church. Another nurse by the name of Dexter finds out that my dad is a pastor, and he tells him the story of leaving the calling that he had in his life to become a pastor because his brother had a tragic accident that left him paralyzed. And because of that, uh, this Dexter guy uh, decided to take an occupational turn and work in the medical field. And he t sits there and talks to my dad. He says, I, I feel like it's too late for God to use me. I, I lost my opportunity. God can't use me anymore. And my dad tells him, God is using you in the medical field. It's a ministry of compassion. And then he tells him, no, nah, but it's not too late. It's never too late. Look at me here in the ICU ministering. More fruit for the glory of God during this pruning process. Now, last I checked, church, check this out, yeah. Last I checked, last night when we left, 630, God had sent to him five people, <laughs> five people who that, who my dad was just ministering to and God was, and God was showing him, I'm not done with you yet, son. I'm not done with you. There's still more for you. More fruit for the glory of God. And who is my dad pointing them to? To God, the great I am. <laughs> Jehovah, Yahweh, church. God is good. God is good, man. I want to encourage you. I, I hope this message really spoke to your hearts. And I pray that it both challenged you because that's what the word of God does. It challenges us. It's like a mirror. It shows us and encourages you guys. And encouragement is basically this. It, 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 it motivates us to do something. That's what encouragement is. It motivates us to do something. Okay. And I hope it challenged you and encouraged you. And I want to know, let you know that if you're here today and you feel yourself detached or not connected to God, I want you to know that God is good. God is patient. God is kind. God is loving. And he's giving you today an opportunity to be attached to him. Can I get an amen for that? Maybe you need prayer for whatever reason. If you'd like prayer, we'll be here after the service and we'll pray for you and with you for whatever your needs are. Because God is good. You know, I'm gonna, can I do something with you guys real quick? You guys mind if I call my pops? He's in the hospital right now. He's in the recovery room. You guys mind if I call him? I want him to uh, let him know. Can we just bring the music down just a little bit? I'm going to call my pops. I'll put him on speaker. And uh, I want to, you know, let him know that you guys are here praying for him and that uh, hopefully this message encouraged you guys uh, through his testimony. So let me call my pops here. Answer your phone, Dad. Hello. <laughs> pops, what's up? I'm here with City Line Church. They're here. You're on speakerphone. Say hi. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I've been watching for uh, that. No, I watched the ten thirty service. That was a really great service. Man. Great. Well, all of them. Great God has God. been working. But hey, Dad, I just I just shared the story of, of how God sent you five people in the recovery room in the ICU. Um, and how you've been ministering to them and remain faithful because you've been remaining in Christ. So can you just share a word of encouragement to the people that are here that have been praying for you and uh, who are encouraged by your story? Go ahead. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, scriptures that uh, get me going here is uh, Psalm 23. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me, O Lord. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me, before my enemies. 
and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house and in the presence of the Lord forever. Truly, God is great. You have to trust him, though. And during these turbulent times, you know, you always have the, to, uh, to go whether you believe in the lie that the enemy is trying to get into your head or stick to the word of God, which has a promise. So I stick to the word of God. I did not believe in the lie because if I, if I believe in the lie, I'll empower the liar. So the liar, I did not empower the liar. Although there were moments, of course, that there was fear in my heart. But because of your prayers, Pastor Jack and the church prayers, uh, I was I was able to overcome it through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you very much for your support. Thank you very much for lifting me up in prayer. And now I'm in the, the recovery uh, medical center. And it will be two weeks before I get in, get out of here. And then I'll proceed perhaps after six months of my mission work to the Philippines, uh, December and January and February. Well, thank you very much, Pastor Jack. And really enjoyed uh, the uh, service uh, uh, this morning. Uh, great, great service, great job. May your God be abundantly blessed. More fruits to you, greater works as promised by God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pops. We love you. All right. I'm hanging up. Love you, Dad. You see, that's that Master Yoda, Mr. Miyagi type thing right, I'm talking about, man. Love Pops. Love Pops. Anyways, I hope you guys were encouraged and challenged. And uh, uh, let's just pray. And then, uh, man, they're going to sing about God's amazing love for us. So let's pray. Father God, thank you. Lord, you're awesome, man. You're good, God. You're a good, good gardener. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love towards us, Father. L Lord, let us find comfort in knowing, Father, that you are with us every step of the way, Father. When we are, remain attached to you, you G to Jesus Christ, Father, even through the seasons and trials and tribulations, Father, the pruning process, Father, we know that this happens for a reason, Father, to bear more fruit so others can taste and see that you are good, God, for your glory, Lord Jesus, because you love us, Father. Thank you so much, oh God. We lift up all of our praise and all of our honor to you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's worship God.